God, what a, a glorious truth to reflect on tonight that uh, you have given us Christ as a firm foundation uh, on which we can set our hope. He is Christ Jesus, who is our hope. And God, for all of the, those of us who have fixed our hope on him, uh, on the words that he spoke, on the promises that he made, uh, our entire eternity is staked on your faithfulness, on the, the faithfulness of Christ uh, realities that we can't see, realities that we have not laid hold of yet, and as we'll talk about tonight, the future certainties that no saint has ever seen to date. And God, we, we believe you, and so you've caused us to uh, see the reasonableness of believing you. And, and I pray that tonight would be just a, a further encouragement to cling to the clarity, authority, simplicity of your words to us, that it would strengthen faith in any here who are, are failing, um, are faltering, and that as we look forward to what's coming, you would strengthen our hearts to cling to Christ afresh. And we ask all this for his glory. Amen. Barry Horner, the author of Future Israel, had this to say about the controversy regarding the land promises to Israel. At the heart of the controversy surrounding the nation of Israel today and the Jews in particular, the matter which most frequently awakens fervent dispute concerns the ownership and inhabitation of the land of Palestine. The land of Israel, a specific geographic region, a material territory, a piece of historic real estate, generates world-shaking concern. In parallel with this, underlying biblical considerations raise the question of disputed legitimacy of the Jewish people who have constituted the state of Israel since 1948 and thus regained the land, or in Hebrew, ha'eretz. While Jews as individuals are barely tolerated in their dispersal throughout the world, it is the current dispute over the land, especially in relation to the hostile claims of the surrounding Arab nations and Arab Palestinians, that continually threatens to bring about calamity of international proportions. It seems that Jewish individualism is endured, while at the same time Jewish nationalism is more strenuously opposed even within the United Nations. So the land has especially become a trigger, a catalyst that ignites worldwide animosity to Zionism. For Zionism is rooted in the biblical concept of the land which epitomizes an indivisible union between territory and people. End quote. Horner is uh, absolutely right about the disdain for Israel and their occupation of the land of Israel in the Middle East. Uh, in fact, some believe that the only way to settle this particular issue regarding who has rights to Palestine is to remove Israel completely. Uh, Hamas is a, a shining example of this, who has made it their charter to exterminate the Jews. Uh, but they're not the only ones. You know, maybe you're thinking, oh, Hamas never met a, a terrorist before. But this is actually a, a more common, um, common man sentiment as well. In 2015, Patrice Cullors, who's a co-founder of Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter organization, in 2015, she said this, 
Palestine is our generation's South Africa. And if we don't step up boldly and courageously, she paused for applause in there. If we don't step up boldly and courageously to end the imperialist project that is called Israel, then we're doomed. And so you have modern organizations that have sort of taken up this uh, terrorist mindset that there are world-shaping problems that could be solved if the Jews ceased to exist. Now, due to the current war between Israel and Palestine that's happening now, uh, this is the, was begun by Hamas's attack on Israel, uh, military uh, moves on the ground, as well as sophisticated uh, cyber attack on Israel's technology recently, uh, killed no less than 1,400 people, and now Israel's strong response against the terrorists in Gaza. This has stirred up conversations now amongst Christians concerning these very things. Who has rights to the land? And so when it comes to answering that question, you have Christians falling on different sides of the issue, and the discussion currently now has turned back to the scriptures and really concerns how do we interpret what scripture has said about the land promises. Everybody would agree land was promised to Israel. It's indisputable. Chapter and verse is just clear. And so the question really is, what do we do with those verses in our Bible? It's sort of like election. Everybody agrees that there's some biblical doctrine of election, but Christians differ on what exactly that means. Did God predestined of his own will, or did he do something else like look down the corridors of time and then therefore choose those who would choose him? That sort of thing. Um, We've got the same passages. The question is, what do we do with them? How do we understand them? And so the current conflict in the Middle East has really raised these questions up uh, for Christians. Now, while we can readily see a a certain political, even national disdain for Israel in some places. Uh, For for Christians, there there is something, uh, I don't know any Christian who hates Jews (laughs) just for being Jews. Otherwise, I would assume they're not Christians. It's not characteristic of people who know Jesus. But there is a kind of theological disdain for Israel. Ethnic Israel, uh, when it comes to that ethnic people's inheritance of the land, the material territory that is now known as the Middle East. Uh, This was promised to Abraham when God told him that every inch of ground that his feet treaded on as he journeyed throughout, and you can trace Abraham's journeys in Genesis, right? Specific place names, some which are still around today by the same name, Uh, other places not known by those names, but identifiable in large degree. So we can trace where Abraham went when he journeyed, And since God made that promise, we can assume that God meant what he said, so he's going to get that land. And so when it comes to these promises, really the question is, how do we understand that? Is, did God make promises that ought not to have been taken literally? Was Abraham supposed to understand God in some spiritual sense? where he was looking beyond earthly territory to some uh, heavenly territory that's going to 
supplant the earth, the earthly territory that he had actually traversed. And so again, the question is, how do we understand those things? Uh, here's one example of an author and, and who, would, who would frankly differ than what we would teach at Grace Bible Church. O. Palmer Robertson says this, quote, the land of the Bible served in a typological role as a model of the consummate realization of the purposes of God for his redeemed people that encompassed the whole of the cosmos. Do you see what he's doing there? It, was a, it, it should be taken in a typological sense. It was just a type of the truer realities is what he's saying. He goes on and says, because of the inherently limited scope of the land of the Bible, it is not to be regarded as having continuing significance in the realm of redemption other than its function as a teaching model. Now, he's got lots more to say about that in, in his own book, but the point here is that this author and uh, other believers who would agree with this sentiment are just saying, hey, the land was earthly, temporal, sort of um, a carnal substitute, similar to the sacrifices in the Old Testament, so that they just served as a type of something much greater. And so salvation isn't actually associated with those lesser shadowy types. The ultimate salvation that they envisioned, that they pictured or pointed to, they're displaced by what Christ brings to fruition so that you can let go of those types and shadows and just find the fulfillment of the actual promises in Christ. That's what is being said. Now, why am I I'm mentioning all of this? We're in our 66 books series, and we're in another book taught recently in main service, Haggai, tonight. And so I'm not going to just rehearse everything we've learned in the past month or so from Haggai. What I want to do that I thought it would be, well, at least fun for me, hopefully it's helpful for all of us and an encouragement, is to look at some, some things in particular, one prominent promise regarding the future found in the book of Haggai in the second chapter and its significance for us, for the New Testament church, for a New Testament audience. Um, maybe even some of you, if you were observant enough, uh, familiar enough with your New Testament, you were thinking when I taught Haggai chapter 2, man, we didn't even look at Hebrews where Haggai 2 is actually quoted. Well, we're going to do that tonight. And what we're going to see that will be a, a stabilizing force, I hope, um, an encouraging factor in your own faith, is that the author of Hebrews does the exact same thing, intends the exact same thing for his New Testament audience that Haggai does for his Old Testament original audience as well. And so this will be an incredible encouragement to just read your Bible, <laughs> to just believe your Bible and take God at his word and to actually go digging in your Old Testament especially for the implications that those ancient words have for you today when it talks about unfulfilled promises. And so we'll see all of that uh, tonight, Lord willing. So that's the goal. Here's what, what I'm aiming at. I want us to consider the coming unshakable kingdom and its Im immovable citizens. You know, outside of our 66 book series, Haggai, if I could title this sermon, it would be the unshakable kingdom and its immovable citizens. We're going to see those two things, an unshakable kingdom and its immovable citizens. And I hope that all of us after tonight can say, I'm one of them, those, those citizens of the kingdom that cannot be moved, will never be, be moved. 
So let's, let's open by considering Haggai chapter 2. Go to Haggai chapter 2, starting at verse 6. Here's what Haggai writes to his, his audience, what he says and preaches in his day. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations and they will come with the desirable things of all nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says Yahweh of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares Yahweh of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says Yahweh of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares Yahweh of hosts. That's our our passage. That's our promise. And it is a portion of this promise that gets quoted in the New Testament that we'll look at. Let me just remind you that everything that we see in Haggai spans about 15 weeks total, and his singular goal in proclaiming everything he did and writing what he did was to call Israel's remnant to prioritize God's gracious presence and enduring promises over earthly comfort by rebuilding the temple. The people's priorities were completely inverted backwards. They established themselves, got situated and comfortable as much as possible in an earthly sense, while neglecting completely the superior realities in this life. Is God among us? What has God said? What has he promised that's coming. And in light of those two things, God's presence among us, if we value that, if we prioritize that, as well as what God says is coming, his enduring promises, how should we live? If they would have set their sights on those two realities, God's presence, God's promises, then they would have been all about rebuilding the temple Because the temple, standing when they inherited the land, really embodied those two things. Do we want God's favorable uh, presence among us, his grace present among us, so that he dwells in our midst in a gracious, favorable way? Well, the temple's got to get rebuilt. It's not okay to just have the altar and make sacrifices because he's commanded a place to dwell. So we need to build him a building in this place, in the land. And that was a task, you'll remember, to his enduring promises, because when David purposed to build God a place to dwell, God instead turned the tables on David and said, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. And so the house that eventually came through David's descendant, David's son Solomon, attached to that and preceding that was God's giving to David a house, that David would have a family. He would never lack a descendant to sit on his throne in Jerusalem. And ultimately, that was the, you know, eventually you trace that promise out. There's a a single descendant, one seed, who's coming, who's going to reign, and there's going to be no end to his kingdom. The, the Jews at the time, David at the time, would have readily recognized that this is a connection of, of older, ancient promises that through, all of, that through Abraham, all of the nations would be blessed. There's a seed coming. He would possess the gates of his enemies, Abraham was told. Isaac was promised. 
And so this promise being given ultimately to David, the scepter would not depart from Judah, David being in the tribe of Judah, this lion of the tribe of Judah, this ruler who would hold the scepter, now, due to the covenant made with David in 2 Samuel 7, that seed would rule as a descendant of David. So if all of these things are true, build the temple. Build the temple. And the people were neglecting that, demonstrating they did not care or prioritize God's presence nor did they care for or prioritize God's promises. So here in chapter 2, now that they have listened and begun to fear the Lord, according to Haggai chapter 1 verse 12, now that they've begun to listen and fear Yahweh, and according to verse 14, God has stirred up the spirit of the leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua and the remnant, and now they get to work, Now, a short time later, God is wanting to urge them on, cause them to persevere in this work that they're undertaking, even as they look at the work that they've already begun and said, it's lacking glory. This is not going to be the same house. This is going to lack the splendor that it once had. Maybe they're wondering, is this even worth continuing And God delivers this timely word through his prophet to say, yes, it is worth continuing. This is a good work you've begun. Don't lose heart. Don't fail now. Persevere in the good work you've begun. And so when this word comes, it's really a way of sustaining the people in their rebuilding of the temple. And so God gives them a glimpse into the future with the promise that we just read from verses 6 through 9. And everything he says in the, about the future, look back at verse 6. From what's written before, verse 6, For because thus says Yahweh of hosts, thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, this is what I'm going to do. And then the details about that time uh, begin to to take shape. So he says, because of what I'm going to do in the future, be faithful in the present. Persevere in the present. You can, you must labor on. And so the people do. He accomplishes this thing in them. Notice verse 4. Three times. Chapter 2, verse 4 of Haggai, be strong, that's for Zerubbabel. Be strong, that's for Joshua. All you people of the land, be strong and work, all of you. So everybody's being urged to take heart, be courageous, strengthen yourselves to work, to labor. I'm with you. And so they do just that. This is a a strengthening word for them, that they would persevere. And so for our purposes tonight, there's really three aspects, three things that I want us to see tonight regarding the coming future kingdom and then our response to these instructions. So it's the the coming future kingdom, what Haggai says about these things, and then the import or significance for the New Testament audience. The first thing we need to see in this is, number one, the particular timing that Haggai has in mind. When it comes to this unshakable kingdom coming, just notice the particular timing that's in view. Regarding these future events, verse 6, once more in a little while. Once more in a little while. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, the dry land, etc. The, the closest we get to an explicit reference to time is just those two details, those two phrases, once more and in a little while. This once more really indicates that whatever's coming 
will only need to happen one more time, and then that's it. One more time, this shaking is going to give way to more stable, transcendent realities, is the point. This isn't a a minor shaking that's going to be followed by other shakings, more subsequent shakings, but this is going to be the final one because it only needs to happen one more time. So the things that can be shaken will be shook once more. That's the, the implication from this one more time that this is going to happen. And then when this happens, it's coming in just a little while. That's so interesting. Just a little while. This is 520 B.C., We're some 2,500 years past this. Is that really a little while? And it just depends whose perspective you're you're asking about. From God's perspective, to whom a thousand years is as a day? Yeah, it's a little while. It's a little while from his perspective. So just notice, even in this promise, Thus says Yahweh of hosts. This is from his perspective. He's the one speaking. He's the one calling it a little while. So from his perspective, it is a little while. And what's helpful about this phrase is to notice that just just what it does for the audience receiving the instructions. If he says once more in a little while, What's the audience left with, with that phrase, a little while? They certainly can't presume on God. They can't presume on God, put him to the test and say, oh, what he means by a little while is long past our lifetime, into many, many future generations, we have nothing to worry about. It's similar to Zephaniah's, a uh, reference to the day of the Lord being near. We're near from whose perspective? Well, God's. That could be tomorrow. That could be next week. That could be 2,500 years from now. From God's perspective, who inhabits eternity, it's all near. And so this would have, this phrase in a little while, would have added a sense of urgency to the people. Even if the little while was over 2,500 years later, they didn't know that is the point. So from God's perspective, he is uh, forcing his people, forcing upon them this sense of urgency. So they can't presume. He doesn't give them a specific date. We know that Haggai is able to communicate specific dates. Right, Four times we get different dates mentioned or four different dates mentioned a total of five times. And so he's able to give us that, but God did not give us that, give us that here. And so this forces on us a a sense of urgency. So that's the particular timing, once more and in a little while. The second thing we need to notice about these promises and this this coming uh, time where the and an unshakable kingdom is, is eventually in view, is the accompanying, the accompanying events. That's a tongue twister. The accompanying events. Just notice in what we've read, when things are shaken, what else is happening sort of in that time, in the same context, around the same timing, as when this shaking occurs. And I've mentioned this, but I think this is a literal shaking. I don't have a good reason, and I haven't seen in anything I've read in commentaries to take it as less than literal. This shaking, so the accompanying events, for for starters, is the shaking of creation, verses 6 and 7. The heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. This is more than just earthquakes because earthquakes don't affect the heavens. The entire globe is what's in view. You know, the the earth becomes like God's snow globe 
and the whole thing, sky and everything else, gets shaken, gets moved, violently so. Everything's in view, heavens, earth, sea, dry land. Verse 7, nations. But notice, when all of these things are shaken, that gives way to, verse 7, the tribute of the nations. Somehow things are shaken, and then after the nations are come are, are, are shaken, presumably after that, they come with the desirable things. Well, if they're, they're shaken to the point of being upset, removed, um, we'll see in, in verse 21 when the promise is made to Zerubbabel, in, in verse 22 that the nations and their thrones, the earthly powers are actually undone and overthrown. So the nations are completely upset. They're toppled to the point that they're hardly recognizable. They're not these established, uh, set-apart, empowered kingdoms, but now they've been brought to nothing as nations. So if they're going to bring tribute, then presumably this is what follows the shaking. The shaking gives way to now they're bringing tribute and I will fill this house with glory. So again, in the same context of this future time, the shaking happens, the nations bring tribute, and the house, this house, is filled with glory. This is either the glory of the Lord or the glory of the, the treasures of the nations. And I think that these both things are true. Whichever one of those things might specifically be in view, both things are are actually uh, realities of this time. The nations will bring offerings, tribute, uh, sort of these, these sacrificial gifts into the house of the Lord when his glory also fills it. So in addition to the shaking of creation, the tribute of the nations, we also see the establishment of a glorious temple. This house will be filled with glory. The silver's mine, verse 8, the gold's mine. The latter glory, that's the coming glory, of this house will be greater than the former. So don't even get down on yourself that you're not building a temple as glorious as Solomon's. There's a coming day when the glory that's in that temple in a, at a future time is going to surpass even the glory of Solomon's temple. And so the establishment of a, a more glorious, a greater temple is in view, as well as the establishment of peace. Verse 9, and in this place, declares the Lord of hosts, I will give peace. That's not the case in our day. There is not peace in the Middle East. There's not peace in Israel, and nor is there the Jews' temple. This day has not arrived yet. Verse 22, fast forward now to Zerubbabel, this word that comes to him. It speaks in verse 21 of the shaking again. So this is the same time that's in view when this once more ultimate shaking take, takes place. Governments are overthrown. The thrones of them, the strength or power of them, of the kingdoms of these nations, this is the removal of earthly powers as well as the overthrow of earthly armies. I will overthrow the chariots, their riders, the horses, and their riders. They'll all go down, everyone by the sword of another. So some battle is in view when the, these armies get overthrown. And then finally, we wouldn't want to miss, also commensurate with this day is the honor of Zerubbabel, verse 23. I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares Yahweh, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares Yahweh of hosts. So, so helpful to remember. And just, again, the details are your ally in understanding this. I will make you like a signet ring. 
rings are worn, right? The signet ring owned by the king as good as the king's own word. This would have been kept on his person at all times because if his signet ring is impressed on some decree, then it's his word. It's as good as his word. It's representative of the king himself, of the king's reputation, of the king's name. But the ring's not the king. But it does represent him perfectly. Bears his honor and holds forth his honor on whatever it's embossed. Zerubbabel is like a signet ring. I think that this just leaves you wondering, well, if he's like the ring, then who's the king? Who's he representing? He's not the one. Is he a descendant of David? Yes. Of the tribe of Judah? Yes. It's through him that the whole line comes. You can read Matthew 1. He's in the line. The whole Davidic dynasty comes down to one man at this time, Zerubbabel. He dies with no heir. The promise is gone. But he is the heir. He does have descendants. And so the line continues. Well, one day he's going to be like a signet ring, but he's not the one. He's not the seed we're waiting on. And so with this time in view, when things are going to be removed, things are going to be shaken to the point of being overturned and undone, how should we think about this as the New Testament audience? I mean, if you've been listening closely, hopefully I've, I've gotten you to the point that we've drawn out the implications. This was intended in Haggai's day to make the people persevere. What does the New Testament do with this? And I want you to go to, uh, to Hebrews chapter 12, because this is where this gets quoted. Hebrews 12. Actually, let me lead you up to Hebrews 12 briefly. Go back to Hebrews chapter 1. What is the, is the New Testament church, who's a Jewish audience, what are they in need of? Perseverance. The very same thing Haggai's audience was in need of. This New Testament audience, this New Testament church, Jewish Christians, are also in need of endurance. And so the author writes to them, preaches to them, really, and encourages them on to persevere, cling to Christ, believe the promises. They're unfulfilled. Let me remind you of what's coming. Let me remind you of what has come. And all the faithful who were looking forward to those things, Notice in chapter 1, verse 13, already at the beginning of the letter, from the beginning of the letter, what's in view? A time when, not to angels, did God say, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. A time when the descendant of David, of the tribe of Judah, his name is Jesus, reigns with all of his enemies subdued. Zerubbabel didn't have the enemies subdued. They needed permission to rebuild the temple. Enemies were all around. Zerubbabel's not the one, remember? A day's coming when the seed of David would have all of his enemies under his, foot, under his feet. And if you just keep reading chapter 2, verse 5, it's not to angels that he subjected what he calls, what this author calls, the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. Wait, we've been talking about a world that's coming? Yeah. When all of Christ's enemies are in subjection to him. This is why he says in verse 8, you have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in subjecting all things to him, he, God, left nothing that is not subject to him, Christ. But now, at this time in history, this is New Testament, what? 
we do not see all things subjected to him. Why don't we see that? Because it's not happening. It hasn't happened yet. But what do we see right now? We do not see all things subjected to him, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. Jesus, because of the suffering of death, we see him crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Those promises have been fulfilled. Christ's subjection of himself being brought low to suffer under God's wrath for the salvation of sinners. This, as we talked about this morning, was how the grace of God was displayed. We we see that happening. That happened. Those promises were fulfilled, but we don't see the ones that haven't been fulfilled come to fruition yet. Well, those came to fruition. The ones coming will as well. The promises that promise a world to come, they too will be fulfilled is the point. So just wait for it. You don't see it yet? Remember, God's never failed. All his promises have happened. Was Christ crucified? Don't you, Christian, believe that? Yeah, you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be a Christian. You, you have entrusted your eternal soul, your eternal destiny, to the already fulfilled promises of Christ and him crucified. Christ incarnate, God in the flesh, lived a perfect life, and died a death he didn't deserve so that you might be saved. And he rose again with an indestructible life. You believe those promises. They've been fulfilled. So what? The ones that haven't been fulfilled? You believe those. You can trust those. And you can persevere in hopes that those two will come true. Fast forward, notice, and it's so helpful to remember in, our, um, in all of our good, uh, commendable desires to be gospel-centered, yes, meditate on the cross, yes, fixate on the cross, yes, dwell often and always on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but just don't stop there. <laughs> Because the saints of old didn't stop there. The gospel in their mind involved future promises. The good news was not merely that Jesus died for sins and rose again, but it also included that Christ would come to reign. And so what? They looked forward. That's what chapter 11 says. Look at verse 10. Abraham, well, look at verse 9. Abraham sojourned by faith in the land of promise. In the land of promise, he, he, he sojourned, moved around like a nomad in the promised land, Canaan, some of which included Palestine. He, he moved around, sojourned as in a foreign land, doing what? Dwelling in tents with his descendants, Isaac and Jacob. They were fellow heirs of the very same promise. Did Isaac reinterpret the promise? No. Did Jacob reinterpret and spiritualize the promise? No. Same promise. They took it just as literally as their father Abraham and believed the same promises in the same way. By the way, if Abraham believed God was believing God for literal land and somehow misunderstood or the promises got reinterpreted after his death, then his faith was a farce. It was wrong. It was misplaced. And nobody should follow in his his steps. The promises were literal. Abraham believed them as such. And so this author says that even his heirs his descendants, rather, fellow heirs, they were of the same promise. He did what, verse 10? He was looking because he was looking. He lived this way because he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. 
Interesting. He was looking for a city. Uh, this gets called a country, a, a territory, whose architect and builder is God. Verse 13, notice, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles in the earth. It really is an error to say that their perspective was somehow short-sighted, somehow too earthly. It wasn't, because this says that they saw the promises. Don't find fault with their perspective. Don't insinuate with our New Testament reading of the Old Testament that their perspective was somehow short-sighted or overly earthly. It wasn't. Their perspective was absolutely right. They believed these things, and they welcomed them from a distance. Verse 14, for those who say such things, I'm a stranger here, this isn't home, they make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. This is not our kingdom, and our kingdom will not be found in this day. We're looking for a future day. There can't be a Christian government, a Christianized government, because then you could say, this is our own. Our inheritance is not now. It is not yet. The point is, if Abraham inherits land like the one he left, pagans all over the place, little bit of land, less than what he traversed on, idolaters all around, not enough land for him to spread out, and for everybody to have sufficient land, right? Remember Abraham and Isaac, or Abraham and Lot's servants? Not enough land for all of them. If, if, if God says, here you go, Abraham, then he's looking around like, this isn't what you promised me. This isn't mine. You promised me something greater. This is why This is, this is called, in, in this context, if you just fast forward to chapter 12, what are they looking for? Where well, they're looking for a heavenly country. And this is where, in their, in their look for this heavenly country, not a, a country in heaven, right, in like the third heaven, some other realm, but a country that bears the marks of heaven. This is heaven on earth, is what, what's meant in chapter uh, 11 and 12 by heavenly country. And so this is where Haggai gets quoted. Verse 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if, if those did not escape who were when they refused him who warned them on earth, there's a reference to Sinai. God spoke and the, the earth shook then at Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given. If they didn't escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. Now Jesus, being in heaven, received his warning. Verse 26, and his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised. Notice the now he, he takes Haggai's words and makes them just as relevant in the present day, the New Testament times. Now he has promised, saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Now this expression, yet once more, indicates the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, what are those things that cannot be shaken? Those things that are, are other than the current created things we see? 
It's not like the, the things that are going to replace the created things are uncreated. No, nothing's uncreated but God. But the point is, what replaces the shaken, created things is this, verse 28. What we're receiving, a kingdom which cannot be shaken. And since that's what we receive, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. This is my very last sermon here. I'm going to take a little extra time tonight. (laughs) I hope that's okay. I didn't mean to go this long, but since I won't be back anyway... Notice that verse 27, this once more, the implication that this New Testament writer draws from this is that, as we've said, from, even from Haggai, this once more means, okay, the things that can actually get shaken, this is so ultimate, so only one more time that this needs to happen. That's the last time this needs to be shaken. So what's the point? It's replaced by unshakable things, and he calls what can no longer be shaken, a kingdom. A kingdom. This is, again, Horner is so helpful where he says this, one of the most significant and yet neglected characteristics of the book of Hebrews, this distinctive portion of scripture, is that the epistle was written by a Hebrew Christian from Hebrew Christians, or for Hebrew Christians, the distinctive character of Hebrews, whoever wrote it, is due to the fact that Jewish Christians are addressed by a Jewish Christian who presumes a Jewish mindset. The point here is don't import a Gentile understanding here that would eschew the, the Jewishness of the reading of this text. What would Jews have been hearing when they heard this? What would they have been expecting? Actual land. An actual earthly kingdom. But again, it's a kingdom that does not end. It has no end to it. So yes, it starts here on earth and extends into the eternal state. Remember we looked at Revelation, Uh, we fast forwarded weeks ago to chapter 21. Let me just remind you, and and this is, in my opinion, one of the the strongest arguments I know for the the coming kingdom being uh, a part of this realm uh, and a literal fulfillment of the promises given to Abraham. I was talking to a friend one time of a different eschatological persuasion, and I I just asked him, uh, you know, what do you do with the the land promises? And just kind of shared some some thoughts, and he said, you know what, I don't know. Honestly, that's the the one hang-up for me with my eschatology. I don't know what to do with those. I'm like, you have no idea how encouraged I am (laughs) right now? Because that's the, the strongest case that I know of to, to think about these things, to understand these, these, these truths. Notice in, in Revelation 21, in the new heavens and new earth, now this is after, you know, whatever the, the, the kingdom that's been established, uh, that Haggai is looking forward to, the millennial kingdom of the Messiah. This is now... Once the the heavens and earth have been rolled up like a scroll and done away with and a new, an entirely new earth is created. Notice what's not there. We already talked about a temple's not there, so we know that can't be Haggai's day. We see that here. 
Verse, two, verse 1 of Revelation 21. Notice what else isn't there. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. There is no sea in the new heavens and new earth. I'm so sorry if you love the beach. <laughs> I'm guessing there's not going to be a beach. But it'll be great. Don't worry. There's not a sea. Go all the way back. If you just hold your place here in Revelation, go all the way back to Numbers, chapter 34. Moses, already having written about the land, the territory that Abraham's going to inherit and that he traversed on in his lifetime, now he's going to mark out the boundaries of that place for his audience about to go into the promised land. Here's what belongs to you, Israel. Go take it. Notice what marks the boundaries of this region. Verse 1 in chapter 34, Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, this is in Numbers chapter 34, command the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance, even the land of Canaan according to its borders. And your southern sector shall extend from the wilderness of Zin along the side of Edom, and your southern border shall extend from the end of the salt sea eastward. Then your border shall turn from the south of the ascent of Akrabim and continue to Zin, and its termination shall be to the south of Kadesh Barnea, and it shall reach Hazar, Hazaradar, Hazar Adar, and continue to Asmon. And the border shall turn from Asmon to the brook of Egypt, and its termination shall be at the what? Sea. Another reference to a sea. Verse 6, and as for the west border, you shall have the great sea, that is its coastline. This shall be your west border, and this shall be your north border. You shall draw your borderline from the great sea to Mount Hor, on and on and on. What's the point? This isn't the new heavens and new earth. What Israel was given as an inheritance by God is this earth. What Abraham walked on was bordered by seas. So he's not expecting the eternal state. If the promises that Abraham was looking forward to only occur in the eternal state, in the new heavens and new earth, then God's promises have failed. Because what Abraham was promised, what Israel was expecting, was bordered by seas, none of which are in the new heavens and new earth. We talked from Zephaniah chapter 2. Each man will bow down from his own place along the coastlines. Same territory is in view. Okay. This is, this is I've made my case for the, for the kingdom. Um, one more thing I want you to see. Go to Psalms, because this is so prominent in the Psalms. These are songs of the kingdom. Psalm 2, this anointed one, the Messiah of God, what will he have for his inheritance? Notice verse 8. This is the one who's referred to as son. He's told by God, ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. And the ends of of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like a potter's vessels. So now, O king, show insight, take warning, O judge, judges of the earth, serve Yahweh with fear and trembling and rejo with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he become angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is soon kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. This king will one day take his seat on Mount Zion, hasn't happened yet. One day it will. He will rule with absolute authority, subdue all the nations, and the only ones who will survive his wrath are those who have taken refuge in him. They are called blessed. 
How do you know today who those people are who will belong to the king when he one day reigns from Mount Zion? Let me direct your attention to Psalm 15. Because Psalm 15 tells us who are the citizens of this kingdom. Who will sojourn in your tent? Who's allowed to dwell on your holy mountain? Who has rights to that place? Well, the one who walks blamelessly, verse 2, works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. Who does not slander with his tongue, verse 3, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. In whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear Yahweh. This man swears to his own hurt and doesn't change. He does these things in the here and now. He doesn't put out his money money at interest according to God's law against God's people, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. The one who does these things will never be shaken, will never be moved or removed. This idea of being shaken, it gets translated the same, two different Hebrew words from what we saw in Haggai when the earth is shaken. But the idea is that they're not shaken. They're not removed. They have everlasting, enduring rights to God's kingdom, to God's holy hill. They get to dwell there. So Christian, you want to make sure that you live to see Jesus' day so that you're resurrected to inherit a kingdom that's coming where Jesus reigns with absolute authority and reverses the curse, then believe him and live this kind of life. You you can have confidence that you will see that day if you fit this description. This is a description of the immovable citizen of the unshakable kingdom. And you know what else is not movable? The king of the kingdom. Look at The very next psalm, Jesus, David putting words, I believe, in Jesus' mouth, he says this, verse 8, I have set Yahweh continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. The king's immovable because he trusts in Yahweh. And his citizens, the kingdom citizens, are also immovable because they trust in Yahweh. And they live this upright life. One more psalm, Psalm 46. Again, I believe a prediction of this same time when this ultimate shaking takes place. Those who, again, Psalm 2, Psalm 46, have made Yahweh their refuge and strength, find him to be a very present help in trouble. This is why they can say, verse 2 of Psalm 46, we will not fear when the earth changes, when the mountains shake. That's the same shake word of Haggai 2. Into the heart of the sea, when its waters roar, foam, when the mountains quake at its lofty pride. Selah, change scenes. What comes after that? Verse 4. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God finally is in the midst of her. She will not, what? Be shaken. Jerusalem one day will will be immovable and will be inhabited by an immovable king and immovable citizens all dwelling in gloriously, in a wonderful, splendorful, splendorous, unshakable kingdom. This day is coming. And so what's the takeaway for us? Persevere. Persevere, Christian. Whatever you're struggling with tonight, don't abandon God. Trust him. It's only for a little while. You suffering perhaps from some bodily ailment, don't worry. It's only for a lifetime. And then the kingdom comes. 
You have irreconcilable relationships with family, friends perhaps. In this life, don't worry. It's going to come to an end soon. And all of that will be overturned in an event. And then all of these troubles of this life will finally be replaced by an unshakable kingdom. Jesus will reign. And if you remain faithful to him, then you will be resurrected with a new body that will be fully fitted to enjoy God forever in that kingdom under Jesus' wonderful reign. And that reign, that kingdom, will extend with you forever. An eternal kingdom to match your eternal life, all graciously given by our great God. Let's pray. God, you're so good to to plan these things for us, to, to give us these promises and to not forsake us, to give us everything we need in your word to cause us to stand, to cause us to persevere one more day, one more hour, one more moment. And I pray for this church that you would strengthen our hearts to see that day, to just take you at your word, regardless of how long it takes you to fulfill your promises, that we would not forsake you due to the length of time because we're thinking about it from our own earthly perspective. We're so short-sighted. And what we need is to put off our own opinion, our own thoughts, and just wholly entrust ourselves to you so that we distrust self and we put all of our faith, all of our confidence in your word so that even these long, prolonged, perhaps, periods of time here on earth seem so short and the kingdom seems so worth it. And Jesus, would you please glorify yourselves, or yourself in our life until we see this coming day. We pray for your glory and in your name. Amen.